I'm uh, going to talk today about two of the Upanishads that I thought I'd, perhaps uh, I'm regrading this, but the word Upanishad itself is often translated as at the feet of the master or the high and the low place together. But I think a better interpretation of the high and the low is that it's the coming together of the macrocosm and the microcosm, or the innermost self with the infinite. But one of these Upanishads is clearly at the feet of, from the monk. It's called the Mundaka Upanishad. And uh, Mund, Munda in this sense means the bald one. You know, it's like, in fact, most of us, uh, this is a thing for young boys when you're born, they shave your balls. You know, it's called the Munda. It's, the child cries a lot, but then there's a big feast for everybody else. So <laughs> I remember that word, but I saw a picture of myself bald. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. But we, uh, uh, and then the other one is called the Prashna Upanishad, which is a set of questions. And uh, it starts with these uh, students coming to a teacher who tells them, uh, live in my monastery for a year before I'll answer a question. So they live there for a year. I think the point of the story is that you have to be patient, you know, to kind of get these answers. Of course, in our world, times are uh, more fast paced. We would uh, appreciate an instructor in a class who said, uh, I'll take a year to give you an answer. But uh, what I'm saying is that even though it says at the feet of the master from the monk and there's a lot of gurus and disciples in these stories, uh, the parts I'm going to read for you stay very clearly that you discover this truth for yourself, you know, and the questions and answers are really amongst ourselves. So I'm looking forward to either to your questions or your comments at the end. Because we'll all learn together is how I see this. And also... It's very clear that uh, the, the effort of these books is, is not to promote rituals or uh, you know, a fundamentalist view or a dogma or a creed. So I, I, I thought I'd share uh, some texts and then uh, give you my interpretation and perhaps we'll discuss them at the end. So uh, what we're talking about, what the, the books are of, of that, which has neither tangibility nor antecedent. It has no color, no eyes, ears, hands, feet. Uh, we are talking of that which is prevalent everywhere, immeasurably minute, self-evident, indestructible, always alive. We are talking of that which we name the source, and it's like capitalized S. So, and then it says, uh, this is in the Mundaka of Upanishad. This is the truth. The sparks, though, of one nature with the fire leap from it. Uncounted beings leap from the everlasting. But these merge into it again. And the everlasting is shapeless, birthless, breathless, mindless, above everything, outside everything, inside everything. It goes on to say, shining yet hidden. The spirit lives in the cabin. Everything that sways, breathes, opens, closes, lives in spirit. It is beyond learning, beyond everything. Better than anything, living, unliving. So, in a way, the idea here is that uh, you can't learn these, this feeling of this oneness, the oneness that we are created from that we see as many forms which are transient, but you can experience it. And that's where I see yoga leading us to, that you can maintain a posture, you have good health, you can have a, a mind that can contemplate this. And the idea is that you experience it, you can't discuss it in learning it. I'll give you some examples uh, from the text and then also from what other people have written about this. Text. But I also want to mention this uh, this is, I thought, quite interesting. It says there are people who think that they have a lot of knowledge. It says fools brag of their knowledge, proud, ignorant, uh, staggering to and fro. They are like the blind and led by the blind. And it says uh, these people do a lot of rituals and these sacrifices with their crew of 18 men are unseaworthy ships. They belong to a trivial karma. And uh, the, 
the fool fixes his hopes upon them and goes to wreck. You know, so you can't really hope that. But well, I think they're countering what was happening is that there were a lot of rituals and people thought, well, if I have a sacrificial fire and make offerings, you know, and speak these holy words, then I'll somehow, you know, find the truth. But you have to find this by thinking about it and experiencing it, by meditating upon it. And uh, it's, it's very clear that uh, this oneness of all things, it's hard to do discuss in words because we see the world so different, you know, and the, these books point out that the, the mind makes the elements, not in the sense that uh, the world is imaginary or that it's totally ideal and the mind, it says in fact the mind makes food, mind makes the elements. The idea is that we see the world in a certain way, so when you think, and I, I heard this from uh, a gentleman who had studied these, and he gave the example of like a dark room where if, it's, if you are in it, you would be blind, you won't see what's happening. That's because your eyes react to visible light. So he was pointing out that if you reacted to some other light, like we have infrared cameras, you'd see the room quite differently. So clearly the way we see the world is based on our mind. It, I mean, that form. There is an inner unity to the world. But uh, I saw once, for instance, uh, photographs taken in the frequencies that bees see the world. And if they look at a petal, it's quite different from how we see a petal. It looks almost like a landing strip, actually. You know, the, the markings that we see are so pretty. It's very clearly like, because the, the plant evolved to help the bee land and, you know, brush the stamen. And so the markings look very different to, to, to the bee than to us. And to me, another very good example is, uh, let's take a... Let's take the, uh, the rail line that goes from Albuquerque to Santa Fe, you know. If you think about the rail line, if you were an ant, that rail line is quite three-dimensional. If you were crawling on that steel post, it would have like a little, uh, little height upwards and then a kind of bulbous stop and it would be three-dimensional. But if you were flying a plane and looking at this line, it's kind of like an ellipse, you know, it goes to Santa Fe, circles and comes back it would look two-dimensional. It would be like a two-dimensional line because you wouldn't see that, that third dimension. You were up on display. And if you really went very far, like say you were in space in a satellite and you saw it, it would be a point. It would be one dimension, this ellipse, that three-dimensional line. So what happens to us, I think, is I've read a physicist who points out that perhaps there are dimensions you know, that are so small that we can't see them because our theories break apart. And in fact, if we... This is very speculative, but if we are trying to combine a lot of uh, physics today, you know, which we have a physics for the very minute, we have a physics for the very large, like gravitational forces, you know, but the two, the two models don't meet. And to try and find this unity, we have to I imagine, though no one's proven it yet, that there are maybe n dimensions, 11 dimensions, or 19 dimensions, more than the three or four dimensions, you know, if you count time, that we see it. Experience. So, what I'm saying is that there is, that's what they mean by when they say it's formless. That the forms we see are made by our existence, by our self, our mind. But there is an underlying unity because, you know, we, we, we understand this today that we all come from similar things that started a long time ago evolving and changing. But this we can't speak in language. We try to experience this. And this is what really the, the, the book, the, the one, the, the Mundaka Upanishad, which is from the monk, you know, it says, that's what this is about. It's a very short text, but it's talking about the, this oneness. I mean, there is repetition in the, in the ten books, but they approach this from slightly different angles. And this one approaches the fact that our mind creates this world, in a way, and also then, we have a self which they, the book calls the personal self and then the impersonal self. Well, what that means is that we have the sense of ego, we have a sense of our, our, I, you know, us, we see similarities between us and other things, other beings, but we have, we are made of something that is indivisible, has a unity, is formless, can't be spoken about in language, which is called the impersonal self. 
But the idea is that these are integral, that they are not separate, they are one. And so we come now to the other book, you know, which is the book of questions. And that's really what these students are asking. Where, uh, they come to this teacher, they say, we'll have questions. He says, uh, wait for a year, you know, live, that, live in my monastery for you. So in the end, he says, okay, ask those questions. And a lot of the questions uh, are about, well, how did everything start? And then uh, what's this life? You know, how did I become alive? And what makes the body? And uh, the question is, uh, you know, I mean, what is this oneness? And then uh, the last one is, uh, you know, that uh, one of those uh, disciples met a king who asked him, like, you know, what are the, where is God, you know, and what are these forms of God that they're talking about? And he says to the uh, teacher, like, I couldn't answer the king. So he said, well, I'll explain it to you. So this is how he explains it, you know, and one of those, uh, I think what captures that uh, idea is that uh, it says when rivers mingle with the sea, they lose their names and shapes, and people speak of the sea only. So similarly, when all of this, these aspects of life, you know, mingle with this oneness, then they lose their names and shapes, and you can only speak of this oneness. Uh, you, you, you give this a name, but really it's faceless, it's timeless. And uh, it says basically that uh, it gives us the example of the hub of a wheel and the 16 spokes, you know. So, in a way, it, it does talk about uh, uh, like each, it, it names each of these 16 spokes, but I don't believe we should take those quite literally, you know. And uh, it says that. Uh, you have to meditate, you know, it talks about Om, what is the meaning of Om really, in this book, and uh, because uh, one of the students asked, like, what, what, so if I meditate on this, where will I go after, after I die, you know, they have questions like that, and this, uh, the answer really is that uh, you have to think of this as, as a unity, that some people think of Om as, you know, made up, it's actually Om, like, uh, you, ma, but, uh, he says, don't think about each of those syllables and, you know, you have to think of this as a symbol that points towards the, the unity. So where uh, all the rivers have mingled into, in, into one. And uh, so the, uh, this, the, the sea, the, to me, the, 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 the important question then is, you know, how does this help me? What do I do with this knowledge that there is this oneness to everything? So I, I like to think of it as that it's like swimming. If, if you're moving in the sea, you know, just like the, the sea is moving, but you're also moving. I mean, we're making choices in life. And we are uh, in, a, in, in, in an ocean, right? We're part of this ocean, but it's moving. So what's happening to us is that, like I said in the beginning, you know, they took a year to, uh, to get their questions answered. We are in a more fast-paced world. So the world has changed. And simultaneously, we are changing all the time. We're making decisions and choices. So it seems to me what, what the, the book is saying is that if you make the right actions, if you make the right choices, and uh, I'm paraphrasing here, talks about the kind of action which is like a form of inaction, because you're not looking for the reward. You're doing the right action because it helps you understand and and connect with this experience. It helps you, gives you the strength to, to see this oneness. And they, this is a oneness that you can't really talk about because language will be made up of division. Even the word OM is made up of three syllables. So all language will be pronunciation, will be phonemes, you know, will be phonetics, will be sound languages, symbols. But you could try to maintain connection with this oneness through the right actions and the right movement through life. So, you know, in a, in a way, it seems to me what we are doing is by not looking at the reward, you have to also realize that there may be no reward. You're not looking at the consequences of your actions, that there may be bad things. You do the right thing, but the, then good things don't happen to you. So, you say, well, 
I thought, you know, if I did good things, good things would happen. But the idea is that you do the right thing because doing that right action brings you closer to this truth. But it doesn't necessarily bring you a reward. You're not looking at the consequence as being a reward. But you will, as the book says, you know, the this spirit, this one that is shining. You'll see the beauty of life. You'll see the gloriousness of life. You'll feel connected. You'll be able to withstand that, you know, the reward or the punishment with a sense of calmness. And that's what I meant when I gave a little extract uh, description of this, these two books, that you're streamlined because we are moving through the world. We are moving through this ocean. We are making the choices. And our hope is, of course, that what's coming to us, what we are experiencing, you know, is helping us understand this, this movement. So the, the idea is that it, as the fish is streamlined, you know, perhaps we will find this, you know, and I'm not saying I found it, but I'm sharing with you what the book said, that if you do the right actions, if you do the right postures, you'll be able to contemplate, you'll be able to move through the world in a way that will help you and will reach you, help you reach a, an, an understanding that passes, you know, beyond words. Like, uh, then what will happen is you will have, in a way, reached a state of inaction, inaction, because you're not looking for the reward. But I'm saying it's, it's, it's difficult. I'm looking for some response from you, too, because you may not get a reward in the sense that I'll get material benefits or I'll, you know, good things will happen, good karma will happen. I'm not denying that that will not happen. I'm just saying that it's not inevitable. It's just that by doing the right thing, you reach closer to this understanding which will help you, regardless of the outcome. And uh, the, the book says quite clearly, Shahed, uh, this is uh, something that you will not attain like transcendentally, you know, that one moment you find awakening. But it does say very clearly that it, it will not come from anybody else, it comes from inside you. Now, I believe yoga, of course, you know, we need teachers, we need someone to help us understand the asana, to understand the postures, to cleanse ourselves, you know, we need people to teach us, to share knowledge, and so, and those who have practiced this longer than us can help us, but in the end, you know, it will take us contemplating, thinking this through, making good choices, learning from each other, really, that will help us come closer and closer to this truth. So I hope, uh, if, if you like, I could read more from these books, but I'd like to open it up to us. Uh, uh, perhaps each of us would share some, some ideas and we can discuss more as we go. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Melissa. But perhaps after the question and answer, we can do some more also. And if not, we'll hear some music at the end. I think it will help us because I, I, I read that it said everything that sways, you know, lives in spirit. And I thought we should sway, sway to music. And really, when uh, to go some, somewhere beyond learning, you know, beyond rituals, I think you have to close your eyes and go somewhere that's not so verbal. And I think music helps us reach there. So, should we start with you? Do you have? It's interesting thinking about the oneness and the language. Lately, I, with my son, we've been teaching him words, so we're almost going backwards, coming because he's everything is that one, and he has the same word for everything. And we're teaching him the individual <laughs> words, dividing right. everything up for him. I just right. thought that was kind of <laughs> the yes. backwards movement that we, is necessary for living in our world today. Yes, I mean, uh, yes, there is no way around this, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a gift, but it implies that we are separate. We couldn't have a self-consciousness, I, I think, you know, in fact, I've read that uh, perhaps the sentence comes before the word, you know, so, I mean, like, uh, birds or even uh, primates will have a certain call if there is an attack from the air. 
and they'll have a certain call if there's a, a snake or an attack from below. So they are communicating about what's above and what's below, but it may be a whole compound sentence. It's not an individual word like a concept where one thing is named, but it's a, like a string of symbols together. You know, and I believe that you know consciousness goes deep into uh, life. Then they're aware. They're saying, look, because there are studies that show that uh, if you hide something like food and show a, a chimpanzee the the hidden food on, on a television set when you let the chimpanzees out into the garden, then they know where that is. You know, they can communicate it to others. You know, to who are going to go and find that food that was hidden somewhere. So they clearly they're communicating. But I think to be human, to be self-conscious, we have to divide the world up to have this ability to, like you said, with the with your son, you know, that each thing is separate and has a separate word for it. But then it comes full circle, right? I mean, through this consciousness of being separate, we reach an understanding that yes, we are one. And if we don't get trapped in thinking that we are separate and that, uh, you know, there are ways to perhaps uh, exploit this, you know, to our own personal gain, I think that's where thinking of that unity helps. Yes, thank, thank you for sharing that. I'm sure it's, a, it, it's such a fascinating time, you know, really, as you see the mind develop. Please. Um, the idea of reward. <clears throat> reward means payoff. There has to be a uh, accompanying uh, satisfaction as a result of the uh, participation in the uh, yogi process. Is that what that means? Or is it, you, know, you say we can't be thinking in terms of reward, um, say, for example, in uh, physical conditioning, it would be a reward of doing yoga. Um, but there is something else that is to be had that cannot necessarily be identified with the word reward. And it's, uh, uh, it's an unknown and unknowable. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, I think you're right. That there, there is some confusion from the way I use the word reward. You know, that I was thinking more in terms of material benefits, not in terms of the yoga practice helping you you know, maintain a posture or get good health. Certainly, you know, you will find peace of mind. And, but you're aiming, it seems to me, what these books are saying, that you're aiming for a knowledge that is at the same time knowable and unknowable. That is a kind of a unity that will be experienced. And yes, you're right, you will progress. So there is some progression towards this understanding. but. It's not I meant reward in terms of material benefits or you know luxury or you know those words. But you're right, you do get benefits of health and you get benefits of perhaps a calm, calm of mind or fortitude, you know, to, to experience loss. It, it, it can help you when you connect with this oneness, realizing that it is immortal, you know, that then death, for instance, is uh, easier to deal with, you know, death of a loved one. Or the idea of our own uh, transient time here that we will die ourselves, you know. But when we realize that it's a it's it's a reflection in a way, you know, it's a movement towards an understanding. So that is, yeah, I guess you could say. So it's a, it's a consciousness, an opening into a consciousness that is um, more. I guess I would use the word complex or at the same time simpler than the ordinary consciousness that we have relative to projects, say, um, having, having to do with uh, gaining, uh, being gainful or gainfully working. Uh, it's something that's quite different than that. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. And that idea is that the more you like it says, the fools who are the blind leading the blind, you know, those rituals, those things that you think will get you satisfaction, you will remain unsatisfied. You will find that when you do the right action without thinking of reward, that you gain more satisfaction. And this, I think, uh, is still 
continues to puzzle me. But I think, to me, the answer is that when you practice it, it, it works. It's, you know, and I'm, I'm wondering why is that? You know, that it seems to me that there is a principle in in the stuff that we're made of. You know, and one of those quotes is uh, that uh, everything is conscious. That when they, uh, when the students ask, like, how, when does life enter the body? Uh, what knits the body together? You know, the answer the, that they're given in that Michelle is that consciousness is in everything. Everything is alive. So that's how you're alive. There's, there's a unity in this. And I'm saying, perhaps, the, you know, there is in, in this spirit, it is a force towards good. And that's how it works. I mean, but I, I don't think I can say, why is that? You know, why is that? But perhaps it's, that's, a, that's a human failure that we think it's a force for good, but it is just is. And we've experienced it as neither good nor bad. But we are heading in that direction. I don't have that answer completely formalized in my mind. But I, I agree with you, so I guess I guess what I'm saying. And I don't know if you have read the books, but when you read them, you find that you're on the same path that, that they're saying. You're not looking for a material reward, you're gaining a consciousness, but you are gaining health and you're able to move forward. To a, like you said, you know, the complex and simple at the same time. Finding this unity of the infinite and the immeasurably minute. Thank you. A little bit to hold in. So when I heard, uh, I was thinking about the word reward as well, but I, I couldn't wrap my mind around reward. What I was hearing was, uh, don't be attached to the fruits of your labor. Right. You know, um, I was hearing that, I was wondering, why do people give rewards? You know, to return a dog? Well, if I found a dog, I would return it, you know, without money, I mean, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's what I would want someone to do if they found, you know, my dog or cat. So the whole idea of reward is, like we have, you know, it, that seems really warped. You know, a reward. You know, why do we have to pay off somebody? You know, um, to to do something what you know um, that is is good. You know, that is a kind of thing to do. And but I, I wasn't hearing reward as much as don't be so attached to the fruits of your labor. And labor meaning well, how whatever it is we do from the moment we wake up. You know. To be aware, you know, just like what is moving us, what is moving through us, um, and it's just so simple. I mean, it just seems so simple. And when I hear posture, you know, the word postures, I think of posture in a very um, metaphorical sense. You know, like how are we holding our posture in life? How are we moving through? What is our posture? What stand are we taking? Are we moving? Are we steady? Are we calm? Uh, are we present to what's going on? Um, yeah. Um, the, pre the question of right action um, and reward, they're interesting words and I'm contemplating them. I have no. Uh, and they both have. The word, the uh, prefix re, which would um, mm -hmm. just so reward, you know. Yes. Perhaps right. I should have said consequences of those actions. You do the right thing because it leads you to a great understanding. Yeah. But rather than saying, I'm doing the right thing because, like you said, I'll, I'll get some money for returning the pet. Yes, so And it feels like something yeah. like not even doing the right thing as. Tuning into what what we're being moved to do. Right. Which, um, I think basically you know, that feels Yes, that same book that I read, if you read on a little bit, it says that this type of ac action, which is really a form of inaction in a way, yeah. will lead you to immortality, will lead you to a peace that you know will not be based on the consequences of you know, they use the word reward, but I think that the, the meaning is deeper, as you say. Mm -hmm. 
that it's a, to me it's 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 hard to comprehend what is this idea of inaction through action, you know. But I think the idea is that we tend to act because we think there's a consequence that would be beneficial to me, you know, to us, you know, my loved ones. But the, 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 the plan is that you can reach an understanding of this oneness and you say, well, you know, this is a transient. There's a, there's a deeper reality to this existence. And that deeper reality is unchanging. I can experience it, and to experience it, I meditate, I think about these things, and that helps me make the right choice when I'm faced with a choice. And then help give me the strength to do the right thing without looking for a material benefit. So for me, that reward, um, even more so than material benefit, can also be uh, enlightenment itself. For me, you know, we're, we're striving for that as a reward also. Um, but we have to lower our expectations. We have to let go of our expectations and completely surrender. So for me, uh, even that reward, you know, in itself, we have to let go of any expectations that we have. Yes, that's very true, because that would itself track you in a way, you know, into wanting something and not realizing, not experiencing that that reward, you know, is not part of this immortal oneness, you know, that's a human idea. I'll reach happiness or I'll reach peace or I'll reach enlightenment. But you may experience something that's even beyond words or beyond that feeling of enlightenment. That's where we hang. Each of us in our own way, you know, to reach an, an, an understanding that's beyond this. Even a word like an enlightenment, then you know, is our duality with this. Enlightenment, then ignorance. So we are trying to reach something that passes beyond this. Am I getting right? That's that, that's what you're saying. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah no, it's, a, it's very true. Sounds like you've already read those two chants. If you haven't, I, I encourage you to find a lot of commonality. And much repetition. You know, I know we went over this before, but sometimes there is an advantage to discussing it again. You just see it slightly differently. I think these two books talk a lot about the self, the personal self, the impersonal self. And I try to give my interpretation of it, that, you know, what we are made of. In a way. But that is in itself uh, not fixed. Because what we are made of, you know, I mean, we, uh, we see the world a certain way. I mean, as many of my pointer, if, he, if we lived on a different time scale, I mean, the Sandia Mountains would look like an ocean wave, right? They're rising and falling. We just don't see it because our time scale is on minutes and hours and years. If it was on tens of thousands of years, the whole, the, the solid crust would be like, a, like an ocean. Or if we were very small, then what we think of as solid would appear totally, uh, you know, like a gas. What we see as a gas would be no different. We could pass through solids, right? I mean, if you were small enough, there's small subatomic particles passing through us right now. So what I'm saying is that it says the self creates this world, but then this impersonal self, but they're intertwined, they're not separate. And uh, I think that gives one then uh, an opportunity when we understand it that way that we're not separate to reach a uh, kind of ex experience not in words and that's yeah, something we head towards we, we don't get it right away mm -hmm. this is an interesting conversation and I um like it's kind of bringing things more together for me. Um, and I really like that you talked about like this action or inaction would lead you to immortality because I think then I began to get, oh, so it's those moments that we, like Laura was talking about, like act on 
selfishly, right, that we just act for the greater good, those are the moments that we're moving more towards, towards the oneness or towards grasping that. But it's, and, and though it's a simple concept, it's not easy to live out all the time. You know, like it's like life example, you know, um, living with roommates and, you know, they don't clean and so, I clean, but it's not out of not selfishness, you know? And, yes. And it's not out of like, oh, I'm loving everyone, so let me do this. It's, you know, like I'm frustrated or, you know, like while I'm doing it. Yes. Um, so it's interesting because it's it's like those moments, those are the moments where like pulled back to the world, you know? Like those are the moments where it's kind of like ensnared again. Um, and I think it's learning to be able to rise above you know, like any, all those moments that we have, that we can rise, rise above that. You know, I think we're headed more towards grasping or understanding oneness. Yes, no, that's very true, because it seems to me that, yes, the, there is one book we, which we covered earlier that I'd, I'd like to mention. It says, take care of your material uh, world and your spiritual world, you know, at the same time. You can't neglect one or the other. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that, Yes, we, uh, it's all one, but clearly the, the connections between this oneness are, are experienced differently. And so, like my child, you know, our child, you know, we say, yes, we feel a, a, a connection with that part of this oneness differently, you know, or with our own bodies as compared to, say, further on. I, mean, I think that when we think of saints, we realize that they are feeling the same connection. They would feel hurt. You know, when we read the news, we can read the news about children, child soldiers, for instance, in Africa. Yes, it hurts us, but not the way if one of our own children or a child of a friend was being forced to do it. But I think if, if you head towards this oneness, it would hurt you the same way. I mean, we would feel perhaps just as, 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 as hurt when somebody else was being hurt. But, Clearly for us, I mean, clearly for me, I think it, I would be lying if I said I feel this one less with everything. You know, my children are more important, you know, but I have to then, if, what if one was hurt? Then you think, you know, well, it's all one, you know, it doesn't matter, it's part of immortality, you know, so I'm not saying that you could, you could, that that would help you at that moment. You would want to, you know, help the, 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 the hurt child. And if, like many people have faced this actually. I know in the story of the tsunami, there was a mother who had to let go of one child. You know. She let go of the elder child thinking that he ha has more chance to survive and help the middle one because and they both survive, you know. And what I'm saying is so we have to make very difficult choices. So yes, we say everything's one, but the connections are different between this oneness. But if we contemplate it, as you say, you know, you rise above it then you can be more centered. You may stop yourself from harsh words, for instance, you know, because you feel this oneness, you feel this, you, you are heading towards something that's more sublime, you know, and uh, that, that can help, you know, and then have to say the right thing, that, you, know, you say it in the right way that helps your roommate scream. <laughs> but, you know, rather than get angry, you know, then it doesn't help, it doesn't help. What I find, you know, you, 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 it, it doesn't help you internally. It doesn't help actually with the people that you interact with. So, I'm not sure we're doing the time, but I would love to play the music that I think will help us. You know, we could, uh, Can I ask one more question? Yes, please, please, please. So, so, so. Um, I continue to kind of think about process, but yet also struggle with the, like, the idea of things are formless and they become form when you think about them. Like I can understand that in a theoretical kind of way, but then I think again when we interface life, it's then difficult to understand that concept. Um, because how is it that we, I mean yes, we all experience things somewhat different. Um, but we can all say, like, the color of this floor, or the texture of it, or how is it that we experience things the same if, if they're from our perception? 
Right, that's very right. But the thing, I think what they're heading, what you're heading to is when the, the, the quote that I gave where it says that this spirit is colorless, you know, that the colors come when we think of separate colors. I used this analogy earlier also, is that you can't have a word like color without having dualities, without having things of different uh, excitations or frequencies, light, you know. I mean, things are colored because they absorb certain frequencies and, and some they don't. So when something, when many frequencies hit, most of them absorb, but the one that not absorb reflects and we say, okay, well, this is blue or this is red. But if we were thinking about this unity of everything, then it is colorless because it can't have color. It's the that there is this oneness that makes all of this happen. And uh, you say, well, what is this? You know, and that's what I'm saying, that you can't talk about it in language, you can try to experience it. But the interesting thing is that physics is leading us to a similar idea, that we came from an infinitesimal point where everything then you know, has uh, motion, has mass or momentum or has energy can move and transform, it's made up of subatomic particles and then these, you know, exchange each with each other and make all of this form and pattern. But truly, they are made of something. It's still unknowable. And the idea is maybe we'll never know. You know, maybe language will not get you to this understanding. But that if you think about it, as you say, when you contemplate it, you can perhaps reach it. Uh, closer and closer to it, but you may never get it. But you can't understand the world as formless. So I try to think of it as, you know, you sink into this feeling, but you come out of it, like when you swim. So to me, it's like you're swimming, you have to let yourself sink into the water to stay afloat. But then you have to come out, take a breath, move your hands, you know, that's how you move. You can't stay something because you need the breath. So when we live, we think about this, and then we come out of it to move and then we sink back to get this feeling of oneness. But you can't have it all the time. But if you could, and that's it, I'm perhaps getting ahead of myself, but the last one, the book that we discussed is called, uh, uh, it's like a dialogue with death. And death says, you know, if you do yoga right, then uh, you will be in constant control of yourself. But it's not possible. You know, for most mortals, that you would be in a state of union and disunion at the same time. It's, 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 it's a very interesting story that this young man talks to death about yoga, actually. So the, the, the point is that, yes, you won't have it all the time. You contemplate it, and that might help you. Or the, when you say, what are these patterns, you know, to me, it's like, it's the wind that, on the water, you know. There's ripples, but the water is the same. So these are patterns that you're seeing, but they're made of an essential unit. And uh, I love the story that says the wise... The, we are like a, a stick floating on the water, you know, the ego is thinking, I divide the ocean. It's floating on the ocean. But the wise man, or the wise, or the wise human, I mean, becomes like a line drop on the water. You realize that, yeah, this ego, I have this sense of, I'm so separate from everything else. But I'm going to minimize that by thinking about it and living right. And, uh, you know, to me, the Buddha ex expressed it very well, you know, which actually a lot of Buddhist teaching comes from the same, the same thinking with some variations. But they use the very similar examples. The Buddha sermons and all those attributes and talks about the mind as a chariot. And in the Upanishads also, there is many examples of the chariot. But what I'm saying is that uh, the Buddha said there is this eightfold path to truth, you know, that if you do the right thing, and you contemplate this, you get this understanding that will pass beyond words. And, uh, but uh, like I said, it's, you have to go back and forth to it, it seems to me. You can't have it all the time. Because there's no way for me, I mean, I couldn't be speaking to you if we didn't see the world as dualities. Neither of these words taken by itself would make any sense if it was, you know, jumbled together. We break it up right away. I mean, even the sound we are breaking up and our mind is reacting to each sound as representing a word, a concept, which is separate from other concepts. So should we play some music? Would you like after we stretch a little fast? Thank you.